Hi, I'm Peter Ramsey. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Hey, Peter Ramsey, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm pretty good, thank you. It's, I must say, it's an absolute honor to have you on my show, first and foremost, the Oscar winning Peter Ramsey. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'd love to start by talking about how you first got into film because you studied, was it painting to start with, and then you, you did some film courses? Yeah, I, I, I you know, I was. Uh, started college very young just coming out of high school and I had drawn all my life and uh, was kind of searching for you know what was right for me and uh, was studying fine art at UCLA and kind of realizing that uh, it wasn't really for me partially because I was I was really too young to understand what art really was at the time it was a little bit of a shock for me to to run into things like conceptual art and uh, you know, some of the, a lot of the things about art history that I just hadn't learned, you know? So mm -hmm. in a way it was a, it was a little bit of a crisis for me, but it also led me to realize that what I was really interested in in all my time of drawing and painting was telling narrative stories. And that kind of hooked up with a love that I had always had for film and, uh, I started thinking about ways to get more involved with filmmaking because, you know, I had played with, you know, back then super eight cameras and yeah. dabbled a little bit, but uh, I had never uh, for a moment thought that there was a way that I could actually work in the film industry. Can it just didn't seem like something possible for someone like me. Sure. And so your first job in the industry, if I understand correctly, was a storyboard artist on Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. Uh, that was the, that was the first studio movie that I ever worked on. I, I did a little bit before that. I had a, by the time I realized storyboarding was a way that I could maybe kind of creep into the industry. Mm. Um, I had uh, signed on with an agency that represented storyboard artists for commercials I and I storyboarded commercials for like a year. And then they got me a job on a movie, which never got made, but I, I got a lot of great samples out of it. And those samples led me to the uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street job. That's amazing. And can you tell me how the storyboards come about? Because obviously the storyboards are the visual guide for the film. But do you just sit down with the script and give it your own interpretation? Or do you sit down with the director and go, can you maybe draw it at this angle? How much sort of creative control do you have over that? Mm. It really depends. Yeah, it really depends on the director, you know, on your relationship with the director. Some directors... They can hand you a little uh, shot list, a piece of paper that lists exactly the shots that they would like to see, you know, like number one, close up, number two, wide shot, number three, this. Uh, other directors uh, say, hey, could you take a look at, you know, scene 156 and try something out? And then, you know, I would give it my shot and go back with them and they'd give me notes. Oh, that's great. But what about this? What about that? Yeah. So it really depends on the relationship that the storyboard artist has with the director. At what point do storyboards get developed? Is it just after you've got a script or do they wait until the casting's done so that you would do visual representation of the actor on the storyboard? You know, typically that doesn't really matter with storyboards. I mean, everybody kind of understands that they're, they're just a rough uh, kind of a guide to yeah. how you're going to actually plan out the shot. That's not usually really too much of an issue. Honestly, uh, whenever the director wants to bring them into the process, usually very early to get a jump on visualizing some of the scenes. And lots of times, if you've got a movie that has a lot of visual effects, which so many of them do nowadays, that storyboarding really is a crucial part of getting into the process really early. Because, mm. you know, like doing a Marvel movie, for example, I mean, all those gigantic battle scenes and everything, all that stuff has to be storyboarded like in great detail because yeah. that's it's become part of their process for uh for uh really working out a huge huge chunks of those movies mm. and because of course animation and visual effects are so expensive at least if you have the storyboards you can turn it into an animatic which means you can watch a version of the film perhaps with some music with some voiceovers mm -hmm. and see what's working and what isn't Exactly. Yeah. You can literally, you can, that's what we do in animation all the time. We create a temp version of the movie mm. before we have to commit to any actual animation being done. 
Are you also a, a continuity artist on Paul Hagen's Almost an Angel? Can you tell us yeah. a bit about how that worked? Did you actually go on set and have to take photos of how people's costumes were and how the set was, or was it more of a visual art thing? What oh, no. Uh, a continuity artist is uh, it's a it really, it's, it's just kind of an, uh, by this point, outdated term for storyboard artist. All it's right, just, okay. <laughs> yeah, continu continuity as in, you know, oh, it's, the continuity of you know one shot to the next. It was right. just another term for storyboard artist. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was imagining it because I know there's some jobs where people have to make sure the the cups in the right place and if oh, someone's got yeah, blood yeah, on yeah. their face and all that kind of stuff. Sure, that's usually the job of like a, a script supervisor. Okay. Let me and see. they will like keep track of like oh you had the cigarette in your le left hand last time and you're you had your eyeglasses on for this take but not on this take and et cetera et cetera. In 1993, you got the opportunity to be a second unit director on Poetic Justice. Was it easy to sort of transition from doing the art side of it to being a director? Obviously, you've been you've worked on a lot of productions at that point, so you would have picked up a lot of stuff along the way. Yeah, uh, you know, John Singleton, uh, uh, who was a, a good friend of mine, I worked on his first four films, and he was, we had worked together on Boys in the Hood before Poetic Justice. Mm. So he knew me and trusted me and we had a good relationship and he they needed some second unit shots done on poetic justice and for anyone who knows that movie it's it's kind of centers around uh tupac tupac and uh janet jackson mm. kind of uh falling in love as they take this mail truck up the california coast and kind of have have some adventures along the way and uh, they needed uh, they needed a lot of shot of not a lot of shots of uh, that mail truck, you know, going up these picturesque highways. So, uh, you know, John had always liked my storyboards and we, you know, connected really well and he said, hey, you should do these second unit shots. Why don't you, you know, I'm going to talk to the producers and, and get them to set you up. And he knew that I had ambitions to direct myself. So it's, I'll always be grateful for him grateful to him for uh, kind of, you know, getting me that shot. He was just great about, uh, great about stuff like that, John was. And uh, so by that time I had like, you know, I had dabbled around in making short films myself and yeah. all the storyboarding I've been doing, I knew, you know, I had a feel for what needed to be in the frame and, and what the movie, you know, what could be plugged into the movie. So it wasn't a huge, adjustment for me in terms of knowing what the job had to be. I mean, it, it was my first time with uh, a professional crew. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where you're like, oh, hey, how many of you, movies have you done? 30. How many have you done? 50. And I'm kind of like, oh, this is my first one. <laughs> so there's that little, you know, hurdle to get over. But, oh. but once you get into it, it really isn't that, uh, it really, or I should say, it really wasn't a huge adjustment. And, uh, I loved it and it was it was a great opportunity for me. Yeah, and it's great for people to know too that there's multiple different routes you can take to becoming a director, you know, from art or any other department really. Absolutely. I mean, for me, it was uh, uh, part of the whole reason I became a storyboard artist was to be mm -hmm. able to be near directors and study and have an eye on the process and, uh, and learn. I mean, uh, for me, it was my version of my version of film school in a lot of ways and you know then on the side I was always uh trying to write on my own so I could have a deeper understanding of screenwriting and story so it's you know it, it you start seeing how uh how much it entails to to direct how to direct a movie and how many different sets of skills it's it's good to have but yeah like you say there are many routes you know people come through it through writing people come through it through uh you know, doing art, people come to it through acting. There's, there's, you know, really no, uh, no, no one set of uh, rules for it. Absolutely. And do you ever go back and watch some of the older films and ones you storyboarded, for example, and go, oh, that was my shot and that was mine. And do you sort of, can you watch the film just as the film now or do you just see the bits you kind of designed and find out? <laughs> It's funny when you work on when you actually work on a movie. I don't know if you can ever uh, see it as just a movie. I mean, it, it's hard for me at least because I know the work that went into the particular, you know, the particular uh, sequences or shots, and uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, particularly with stuff that, that I work on, I'm always like, oh, I wanted that to be better. Or, oh, it could have been more like that. Or, uh. So it's, it's always, uh, you have this impossible goal in your head. And mm. if you fall even a millimeter short, you know, at least me, I can't stop beating myself up about it. <laughs> you worked on some really iconic films here in the 1990s. I'll just mm. uh, read from this there. There's Fight Club, Cast Away, Being John Malkovich, mm. uh, Backdraft, Dracula, Grinch. Um, when you were working on all these films, was it different for every time or would it be a case of you'd work on one movie, then they'd go, hey, we're working on this other one, we're going to bring you all across to work on that too? Um, yeah, kind of a mix. I mean, I, I during the 90s, I actually... Uh, there were several directors. Uh, yeah, actually, probably the majority of what I did was different projects with the same director. Yeah. Like yeah. like uh, John Singleton, like I said, there were four films with him. Mm. Uh, with David Fincher, there were two movies and then other assorted stuff, like maybe a commercial here and there and things yeah. like that. Uh, Spike Jones, uh, the same thing. It was... Yeah you know, two movies and then a bunch of other commercials and, and videos and stuff. So uh, Ron, ha Ron Howard several times. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, you know, part of the job of being a storyboard artist is kind of reading the mind or anticipating the, the, uh, the taste of the director that you're working with. And uh, I think for a director, uh, the, the, the less time they have to spend explaining themselves or, walking somebody through their thinking the better yeah. so if they get a connection with somebody and they feel like oh peter knows what i'm talking about peter gets it or who you know whoever it is not just me but but uh, that is very valuable to them because there's a lot of things you have to pay attention to as a director when mm -hmm. you're making a film so uh speed and clarity those things uh uh, are, are, are very prized. Yeah, and I, I guess a, a visual guide must be so important when you've got just not just actors, but you know, producers and all these different lighting and cinematography on the set as oh, well, yeah. trying to bring this thing together and work towards one vision rather than making their own version of it based on what they interpreted from the script. That's one of the, one of the biggest things in filmmaking is getting everybody on the same page mm. instead of it turning <laughs> into a game of telephone because that, that turns into a disaster. <laughs> really it's like with this as well i mean i've got thousands of people that work on this show and it's a nightmare and, and so you you also worked with steven spielberg didn't you on the minority yes. report and ai yes exactly well, right mm -hmm. what was he like to work with did you get to sort of speak to him much during i imagine no. the scale of the scope of these films are huge exactly and and it's like he is like uh he's like the general of an army i mean it's like a it's it really is like he's he's running an empire uh, on these films and he works with uh he uh, again he works with a lot of people he's worked with over and over that he trusts and that know you know they kind of know what he likes and what he doesn't or they know how he likes to make decisions yeah. so they they'll have like well, well which shoes okay we've got 18 pairs here that he's gonna <laughs> pick from and i i kind of know the range he'll like one of these but i'm gonna well, we're giving him this so it's it's uh uh, I really, you know, on AI, it was interesting. I think that was the, I think that was the first time I worked with him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the script was super top secret because it was, uh, this collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and, and Steven. So he didn't want, or I should say, say the production didn't want to give any scripts out to anyone. So the, the sequence, first sequence that I worked on, uh, Stephen literally sat down at a desk next to me and he kind of started doing little doodles on uh, typing paper and talking me through the sequence instead of me getting script pages. So I was kind of sitting there sort of taking dictation, of, you know, along with him as he was kind of doodling and I would do my doodles. And it was this really cool thing happened where, you know, I've seen so many Steven Spielberg films over and over that I had a, a sense of his style and his, yeah. his cinematic language. So it was getting to the point where he'd say, he'd call out a certain kind of shot. And then in my mind, I'd be seeing it play in my head and I'd go, oh, I bet the next shot is gonna be this. And then he'd go, and then we're gonna do this. And I'd go, yes, I called it. <laughs> because you can, you know, it's like, it's uh, when you get a sense of somebody's, somebody's 
visual style, their storytelling mm. style, you kind of, you, you know them a little bit, you know, so you can anticipate. And it was a, it was a pretty wild experience. Well, that's amazing. And then obviously you, you worked on loads of films, you worked on Tanko and Aaron mm. Warner was the producer of that. And it was him that sort of suggested you to get move over to DreamWorks Animation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, on Tank Girl, uh, that was another film uh, I both storyboarded and I uh, directed uh, the second unit. Oh, wow. And, uh, so just I take... love that film. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was a lot yeah. of fun. It's very crazy. It was directed by uh, Rachel Talalay, who now mm-hmm. does a lot of, uh, like, she's the goddess of, like, Doctor Who, I think. Right. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, sec- a second unit basically is uh, uh, the the team, the the crew that does a lot of the shots that the main unit that works with the stars and the, mm. uh, you know, a lot of the uh, stuff that involves the main actors, but there's all, there's always other shots on the side, like, Oh, we need a shot of the car going down the highway. Uh, if it's an action movie, a lot of times the second unit will do the actual action, yeah. you know, the explosions and the stunts and stuff like that. That's what we did on tank girl. That's so uh, yeah. And it was, you know, Aaron, so Aaron knew, had seen me at work as a director so that when he called a few years later about, uh, about DreamWorks and he was in, he was in animation, he really, he thought, you know, this might be a good opportunity for you to get to direct and they're look, they really need people that have, uh, your skill set. You know, you can draw and pre-visualize, but mm. you can also work with the team and, you know, get that stuff on screen. So, um, he had, he had actually called me twice, once for the first Shrek, and yeah. I kind of turned him down. I think I was like working on Fight Club or, or, or something. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a, a few years later, I was kind of ready to give it a shot. And I went, uh, I went thinking I would just stay there temporarily, and right. uh, it was so nice. I ended up staying for like close to, well, 10, 10 11 years, I think, yeah. all together. Yeah. And then so you worked on Shrek the Third, and yes. Shrek the Hawks as well, the, the Christmas special. Were they developed at the same time? So I know obviously animated films take years and years right. to produce. Were you kind of overseeing a bit of one project and then another, or was it you finish one and work on the next one? I th- they kind of, uh, they may have overlapped a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. I, prob- I, I was probably finished with, I, I'm pretty sure I was finished with Shrek the Third with my little piece of it. I, you know, I was just yeah. a storyboard artist on that before they asked me to come in and help on uh, Shrek the Halls. And that was just a, you know, sometimes you, you see people, you see credits uh, for films and Shrek the Halls, I'd be surprised if I worked on that more than two weeks. Right. You know, so it was, but there was, a, I was jumping around doing all kinds of stuff at DreamWorks during that time. And they were, uh, they, they kind of started like giving me things to uh, kind of put me on a track toward directing something there. Yeah. Just learning how the studio worked and, you know, how to work with the different departments and, and uh, what everything entailed. I mean, it's so great to have that access to, and it must make a huge difference being a director now, having worked in all these different areas so you can appreciate more what the, the teams are working on them and sort of be able to give more valuable advice to them as well to help them move up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the more you know about how the machine works, the better you're going to be able to make it do what you want, you know, so it's, uh, and, and, and the better you can bring out the most in other people when you know what, what their job entails. Absolutely. And so mm-hmm. you, your first actual directing role was Monsters vs. Aliens, <laughs> Mutant Pumpkins from Outer Space. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> My big debut. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I had worked on, uh, I was, had been the head of story on the, uh, um, the feature Monsters vs. Aliens. Mm. And uh, they asked me to, uh, they had this uh, Halloween TV special they wanted to do, and they asked me if I would do it. And I said, yeah, sure. For I mean, for me, it was a great, fantastic learning experience. It was a way to actually, you know, as I said, you kind of learn, you're working with all the different departments as the director, you've got to, you're working with the writers, you're you're getting a real taste of like how the whole process works as opposed to what I had experienced just being a storyboard artist. So, so that was, uh, I, I think that was like nine, 10 months of work to produce 20 yeah. minutes, 20 something minutes of animation. But 
uh, I learned so much, you know, I really coming out of that, I, I was kind of much, much more uh, prepared to direct something at, at, to direct something larger. And so I've got a very important question for you. In addition mm -hmm. to directing that short animated film, you were also the voice of Farmer Jeb. <laughs> yes. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've been worried about this for about a decade now. <laughs> is he okay? What happened to him? Are we going to see him again? Will he turn up in the background or something else? Because he disappeared, but did he just oh, fall asleep? God, poor Farmer Jeb. You yeah. know, I, I, I like to think that, uh, wow, after 10 years, Boy, I think he might have ended up as fertilizer for some more crops in his in his own farm. <laughs> but, <laughs> so he does live on, but in a different way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, the circle. It's the circle of life to steal from a different animated uh, movie. It really is, and that's amazing voice cast as well because the cast from the the feature length film sort of carried over, didn't they? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you know those uh, those you got something short like that. The actors they can do their they can record everything. Uh, they they can record an, an entire part in a couple of hours in general oh, wow. for something, yeah, of that size. So it's it's yeah. not too much of a not too much of a stress on them. Yeah, so it must make it a lot easier with people going on to work on different projects. You only need a day of their time rather than flying them in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so then you work. You then went on to direct Rise of the Guardians. Can you tell me how that came about? Because it's based on a series of books. How did you get involved with that? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Guardians had been something that was in the works at the studio for uh, a little while before mm. I got involved with it. Uh, they had uh, been working with Bill Joyce, who wrote the original books and just came up with the whole concept, which was pretty great. Mm. And they was, there, was a, there were a couple of other teams of people that were trying to crack the story and a lot of beautiful artwork and a, a lot of great work had been done, but it never, it w just wasn't really gelling. And, uh, you know, as I was, I remember as I was coming off of uh, uh, Pumpkins, they were, they had reached kind of a, a point where they were ready to sort of make a, make a change in the way they were, in the way they had been developing it. Mm. And they asked me if I, you know, they were happy with how the, uh, how the short turned out, you know, it had aired on TV and, and everything did pretty well. And uh, so they asked, Hey, would you come on board this and, and uh, you know, take a crack at it with, with a new team. And I was like, of course, that's why I'm here. So, uh, so yeah, for me, it was, it was, a, it was like a golden opportunity kind of falling into my lap. And it was, uh, uh, it was great. I mean, they're all, they're all tons and tons of hard work and they're yeah. all, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, personalities involved, you know, uh, compromise and the whole, the whole thing, you know, you name it, yeah. but uh, working on it with working on a movie like that with the, with the artists you get to work with is just an amazing experience. I imagine so. And it, so it was released in 2012. So mm -hmm. to me, obviously there's, there's films like the Avengers and Justice League, but Right. I've got to say, this is the ultimate team up movie. You've got Santa Claus in there yeah, and right. all these other amazing characters, right? That's right. Hey, that's what I always thought. I was kind of um, like, who wouldn't, who couldn't like this? It's incredible. And they're all fighting. Uh, books favorite too. one of those? Have you got a favorite character from the film? Oh, God. Uh, uh, I've, all, I've always had a soft spot for, uh, I mean, you know, I love them all. They all become like your kids, you know. Yeah. But uh, I, I've got a soft spot for uh, North, our version of Santa Claus that we did. Yes. I, I loved him. I really loved him. One thing I loved about the film too, it not only takes these characters, you completely modernize them too. So I understand it's set hundreds of years after the books, but mm -hmm. Santa Claus and North has got tattoos and all this kind of thing. And right. normally you always see the exact same version of these characters. So right. I love the sort of creative leap and having your own version of them, even though they're so well loved. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, our our goal was to kind of we we kind of wanted to shock people a little bit with these yeah. like versions of the characters that seemed really different. But when you watch the movie, and by the time you get to the end of the movie, you realize, well, actually, they do exactly what the classic versions of the characters yeah. do. Santa Claus is all about bringing joy to kids by bringing gifts. 
even though he's got tattoos and he's carrying swords. Mm. The Easter Bunny is about, you know, renewal and life and hope and bringing, you know, they, they all do exactly the same things. It was just a, to, to kind of try to present them in a new way to get people to look at them, like with, look at them past the stereotype that they've always yeah. had. Exactly. And yeah, they, they definitely have the sort of characters that you know and love in this fresh new way, which I think mm. just made the film all the more interesting. Can you tell me a bit about how, so obviously a uh, director of a live action film would go onto a set and they direct the cast and all the mm -hmm. moving things going around. Obviously there, there isn't that for an animated film, but there, there is, but they're, they're models and they're, they're digital sets and stuff like right. that. So how would it work? Would you sit down with a team of animators and go, okay, we're going to try and achieve this and then go and try and direct the voice actors and all that kind of thing. Is that how it would work? Yeah. I, I mean, what, what you end up doing, I mean, you know, we do the storyboard uh, pass of the film, the animatic, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, we are basically a bunch of us working on the film will generally do voices. Yeah. So on that movie, I think I played, I played Santa Claus and whatever other role needed to be filled at the time. And, You've got, oh, you sound kind of like the Tooth Fairy. You can do her. And, you know, you kind of cast it with just, it's scratch, uh, scratch dialogue recording, we call it. Yeah. And that becomes our, uh, our first, uh, uh, we, we cut those voices to the uh, animated storyboards. Mm. And so it just becomes a, a, you know, put music in, sound effects. So it just becomes a very rough version of the movie. And once you have that, you, once you know, okay, this scene's going to be this, at least for now, this scene's going to be this. Then you uh, you call in uh, your voice actors. You record their voices. You get the performances you want from them, and that gives you something that the animators can begin to animate too. So they're taking their emotional cues for the performances, energy, and all of that stuff from the uh, from the voice performances that our actual actors give. But be, and actually before the uh, before the animators actually even get to work, there's another phase called layout. Right. And that's like a kind of a rough animation in which, you know, we've got 3D models, computer models of the, all the sets and all the environments. And we drop little sort of crudely rendered uh, CG figures in there. It, it's, they're getting more and more sophisticated, but they're kind of like little puppets, little digital yeah. puppets. And those start taking the place of the storyboards. So we'll use the storyboard as a guide. We'll go to layout and we'll, you can work with little digital cameras and you kind of arrange things, the action, uh, so that it plays out like it was playing out in the storyboards. But now you have uh, a, a, a fuller, more, uh, more 3D rendered version of it. Mm -hmm. And once you get that laid down, then you, you call in the animators and we say, okay, here's the, the scene and layout. There's the voices. Uh, let's start animating. And then it's like for the director working with the animators, it really is like directing actors because yeah. you can say, oh, I think, think it needs to be more tense here. I want to see more anticipation for this moment before he moves. And let's delay this. I blink until after that moment, you know, so it, it really can get very, uh, uh, very detailed. Oh, yeah. And I guess the, the the actors never get annoyed because they're, they're puppets. So you can have them do <laughs> right. a thousand takes, right? <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, the animators can get annoyed. <laughs> yeah, that is really Everybody true. gets annoyed. It's a, uh, it's a, yeah, but it is it is a thing where you can uh, down to, you know, as, as time allows, you can get down to the smallest detail with those animated performances and really, like, really, really, uh, visually create the emotion that the actors are giving in their voice in their voice uh, performances. If you look at 2D animated movies in say the 1950s and the 1980s, it's not a massive mm -hmm. visual difference because they're, they're two, they're, you know, they're just 2D cell mm -hmm. shaded cartoons. But if you look at 3D movies, if you go back 10 years or 20 years, there's a huge technological leap that you can sort right. of tell when you go back and watch these older films. But I watched, the film very recently and eight years old looks stunning. It looks really, you know, oh, almost ahead of its time, really. Like it thank really you, stands thank up. You. Thank you so much. We we you know we we had such 
gifted people working on that movie and they were all trying their best to do something special. Uh, uh, our, our production designer, Patrick Hannenberg, and our uh, visual effects supervisor, uh, Dave Prescott. I mean, we, you know, we just had a, a, an amazing team and they were really trying to bring Bill's ideas to life. In, in a, we wanted it to have like a, a storybook feel, but we also wanted it to feel real enough that, that you related to the characters as, as real. Because when you're a kid, you think of them as real. They actually exist to you. So we they still do. try to tap into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, kids. Yeah, that's right. They, they, yeah, they still do. Absolutely. <laughs> they do if you believe, otherwise you don't get presents, right? I think that's how it works. <laughs> well, I, th I think they're a little flexible about that. But. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so have you got any favorite scenes either from the actual production of the film or just watching it back? Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I always love the opening, uh, the opening of the movie where, you know, Jack Frost, you know, rises out of the ice and, and, uh, that was, uh, I was, I still feel like that really worked the way that I saw it in my head. And, yeah. and uh, we had, we were really lucky to have Roger Deakins, uh, who's like one of the best cinematographers alive to come and advise us on the lighting and the color in, in that sequence. And we didn't get to work with him for very long because he had to go mm -hmm. off and do Skyfall. Right. But, but uh, it was really amazing to be able to get his input. So that's one of my favorite scenes. I really, uh, I think I, I kind of love the sequence where, uh, oh God, there's, as I think about it, yeah, there's quite a few. When the, uh, <laughs> when pitch, shows up at the North Pole and the giant globe is going dark. Yeah. I really enjoy that. Uh, the, uh, yeah, there's, oh, there's, there's a lot of moments. Um, I think the, uh, the very end of the film I really like. Uh, there, um, yeah, it's hard. There's so many. <laughs> oh, I know. When Jack Frost arrives at the North Pole. I like that one a lot. Yes. Yeah, the whole film's a lot of fun. And I remember going to see it at the movie theater when it first came out. And I've seen it mm -hmm. several times since. And it was fun, again, to watch how many times I've seen it now. Again, fresh. It's still really enjoyable. Oh, thank so. you. Thank you. Glad, so, glad, glad you're still digging it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, right. Mm -hmm. I say, what is it? <laughs> And so Guillermo del Toro also writes on the film, didn't he? Was he more involved in kind of the story aspect? Uh, yeah, kind of. Guillermo, uh, uh, yeah, he was. Uh, Guillermo came on at a time when we were really working on the structure of the story. And he was really, uh, uh, he was really, really uh, helpful to us as kind of a, a, a guide and a mentor and really helped us reshape how we were telling the story, which was super valuable. Mm. And uh, yeah, he's just great. He's, we had uh, just to be around him and, and talk with him and listen to him. And mm. uh, he's just so inspiring, uh, ab an absolutely amazing, amazing artist. And so uh, I, I've held off long enough. I have to talk about 2018 Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. You are, of course, co-director mm. of the film. How did you get involved with it? Uh, I got involved with Spider-Verse. Uh, I had been, uh, you know, when it was, uh, when Spider-Verse was sort of coming together, I was actually directing another film for uh, Avi Arad, who's one of the producers of Spider-Verse. Right. He's also, he was also a producer on a bunch of the uh, live action Spider-Man movies. And Avi is just this great, uh, he's a really fun guy. He uh, at one time was a part owner of Marvel Comics. And he really is the guy who is, was instrumental in bringing the Marvel, the whole Marvel idea to the screen with Marvel mm. films. And he was right in there from the, from the beginning. So uh, I was uh, directing another movie that he was producing and this, uh, the started hearing rumblings about, about uh, an animated Spider-Man going on at Sony. Mm. And, you know, at the time I didn't think much of it. I was kind of like, yeah, who needs another one of those? You know, it's <laughs> like, there's been, you know, gazillions of Spider-Man movies at this point, right. what can you do differently? And then I found out that Phil Lord and Chris Miller were involved. And I sort of went, Oh, if those guys are involved with it, that could be something really fresh and interesting. Yeah. And uh, as luck would have it, you know, uh, 
I, I was, you know, I, I think I, I was, I mean, Avi told me, oh yeah, you were on the list to, dir- you were on the list to, to direct it, but I told him you already have a job. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I had I had just signed with Avi a couple of weeks before I started hearing about it, so I was like, "Darn it!" And uh, but uh, it sounded like it was going to be really cool. Several months later, I heard that my my friend Bob Persichetti, who had been at DreamWorks Animation while I was there, uh, had gotten the job to direct it, and I was like, "Man!" Because you know, Bob, he's uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant artist and writer and uh, studied animation at Disney with uh, Glenn Keane, who's like one of the greatest animators. Yeah. So uh, Bob is just, and he's just, he's just so creative. So much of the, so much of what people see as the originality of Spider-Verse mm-hmm. comes from Bob. And so when I heard that he was g- uh, gonna join forces with Phil and Chris, I was like, wow, this movie's gonna be absolutely amazing. It's so exciting. And uh, then, uh, then fate stepped in, and the movie that I was working on went down. Right. Yeah, it had been. It was being financed by a couple of Chinese corporations, and one of them pulled out, and the whole mm. thing went poof. I know. And uh, you know, since Avi was producing that one, uh, you know, he had told Bob and uh, and and Phil and Chris, "Hey, I think Peter might be available to come help us out." And uh, and he was also hoping that this movie was going to come back up. So I think he liked the idea of having me close by. But I got a call from Bob and said, hey, uh, I heard you might have some free time. Do you want to come and storyboard on Spidey? I said, sure. So I went and I storyboarded on Spider-Man with Bob for, uh, I don't know, probably uh, nine, eight, nine, ten months, somewhere in there through 2016. And toward the end of the year, I guess they had been talking, talking it through the studio and realizing, you know, this job is so huge and the schedule is so tight. It mm-hmm. looks like we're going to need more directorial help. So they asked me to come on board uh, and co-direct with Bob. Fantastic. So that's like the long, the long winded <laughs> story of how it happened. <laughs> that's, that's so amazing. And I, I love the, the, the main character is Miles Morales. We haven't seen him before. We've seen Peter yeah. a billion times, as you've said. Mm-hmm. And, I love that how how crazy that film gets, especially yeah. towards the end and stuff, and all the different elements going on in it. He's still Miles is still grounded, and there's these different family dynamics and all that kind mm. of stuff. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, that was our that was our absolutely our number one biggest challenge of the whole thing was finding a way to uh, to tell the story and not not to hold back from like going wherever we wanted creatively with it and still have the audience be able to relate to this kid and not just relate to him, but feel for him and empathize with him and yeah. uh, tell a real emotional story ab- about him that felt fresh and new. So um, we were every step along the way, you know, we were always trying to figure out what is the, what's the version of this that's going to be, that's going to express Miles' story and his feelings and his, uh, thoughts the most. So really, every time we had to make any kind of create, creative decision on the movie, we were trying to take that into account. Absolutely. And um, can you tell me a bit about the casting process for the film as well? It's got a phenomenal cast. Yeah. I mean, uh, really, for us, it was kind of our wish. We would just spit out our wish list of people who we thought would be great to yeah. do the roles. And I think for the most part, we got everybody we really wanted. Oh, I, can, I don't think yeah, I don't think there's anybody we really wanted that we didn't get. Like, even I, I remember we were we came up with the idea of, oh, what if what if Mahershala Ali was the Prowler, yes. and we were sort of like, man, that'll never happen. But he agreed to do it. You know, he liked the idea of the character, and he liked the idea of Miles. So he uh, he pitched in and and did it. And uh, it was uh, you know people like. Um, uh, Catherine Hahn, who plays Doc Ock, was just a, a brilliant, perfect idea. And, yeah. You know, we had to keep her secret because we didn't want anybody to know that the character was in the movie. <laughs> but um, she was like, the casting, her casting was just absolutely amazing. So it was, it really was us kind of like trying to like, wow, what could be, what are, what would be the, the really sort of, uh, 
who would get to the heart of these characters, you know, who could mm. really ex express it and, and be a little surprising, somebody we maybe wouldn't quite expect. I think so. I remember when the film finished and obviously you recognize a lot of the, the voices in the film and, you know, people that are involved in it too. But when the credits mm. go up at the end, you're like, wow, look, all these people together. Yeah, I know. Right? I know. I mean, and I, you know, I'd be, I mean, it, it's kind of, I would be pinching myself because one day, you know, I'd be directing a, uh, Mahershala Ali in the voice yeah. booth. Next day, it would be maybe Lily Tomlin. It was just like, what am I doing? This is absolutely <laughs> incredible. And was there ever any plan to have live action versions of Spider-Man like Tobey Maguire and Tom Holland in there? Oh, we, we, I, we, I, we actually tried at one point. For the, I think for the end credits, yeah. there was an idea floating around that, you know, somebody would pop through a, a, a dimensional portal into... <laughs> you know, uh, Tom Holland's uh, room, bedroom or whatever, you know. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. There were, there were all kinds of ideas. And it was kind of like, no, 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 it'll never happen. We can't. It'll be too confusing. We can't do that. We can't do that. But I think, you know, probably, you know, some of the, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure some of the people who were who didn't think that would be possible or wise after they saw the movie were probably thinking, mm, we probably should have tried that because <laughs> yeah. I just don't think they were, they, could imagine how crazy the movie was gonna get and yeah. still managed to uh, still manage to make sense to people. And how would those characters have been represented on screen? Would they have had animated counterparts or would they have still been live action? Oh I think I think if we were gonna do it we all, we would have wanted to just do them in live action. Yeah. And have the animated characters pop into their world. <laughs> and we just would have said, hey, they're in a live action dimension. <laughs> so yeah. you know. <laughs> That's such a funny idea. But yeah. then in turn, that means that in a live action film, you could have an animated character turn up, right? That's right. Theoretically, yeah, sure. It's like Spider Mary Poppins. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so my understanding is there were upwards of 140 animators working on that film? Yes, yeah, it, which was a huge, a huge, huge number. Uh, the uh, Up at uh, in Vancouver, where Sony Imageworks is situated, uh, yeah, there were tons and tons of animators kind of coming in and out and jumping on and off. And, uh, you know, I remember myself and uh, Bob Bob Persichetti early on being really, really a little nervous about it because mm -hmm. when we worked at DreamWorks, you know, everything at DreamWorks was in-house. All the animators literally worked at DreamWorks and we could, you know, we would meet them all the time and face-to-face. -face and uh, the situation with uh, spider Spider-Verse was different in that, uh, you know, we were working down here in Los Angeles, yeah. but the animation was actually being done physically in uh, Vancouver. And, you know, our teams at DreamWorks, there'd be like 40 people or that, that would be like a pretty big team for us. Mm -hmm. And when we started hearing like, oh yeah, at the height, there'll be like a hundred and, you know, 40, maybe 180. And we were just like, what? Oh no, how are we ever going to manage? And we really... <laughs> We it, we're really worried about it, you know. Yeah. But we had, uh, but uh, you know, those teams at Sony ImageWorks, they're used to having big teams because they do animation on a lot of uh, uh, like visual effects for live action movies or the yeah. contract out for other animated movies. So they've kind of got it down, and they had just such amazing uh, animation supervisors who knew how to like kind of work creatively with big shifting teams uh that it worked it worked it worked great yeah. it worked so much better than we ever dreamed or hoped because because we had rush beverage our head of character animation was just like a a gift and can you tell me a bit about the visual style of the movie because obviously it's like a comic book brought, brought to life it's like you know living artwork and not only that but every iteration of spider-man has their own visual style as well did the film go through different sort of artistic looks did it start off was it going to be wildly different to what the final product was or was that always kind of the, the intention or what it should it look yeah. like the intention was always to do something that didn't feel like uh, a cg didn't feel strictly like a cg animated film hmm. uh, from the very beginning uh uh phil and chris uh and and Bob as well, you know, before I came on, all their conversations were about 
how do we make this film feel more more handmade and like the work of like the personal work of artists yeah. rather than something that you know you just downloaded the software and used it right out of the box as is so uh the idea was to take the language of comic books mm. and find a way to represent that on screen uh our production designer justin thompson by the time he came on and J justin came on a little bit after i came on he he was really uh really key in figuring out really how to do that because we were all talking, yeah, the language of comic books, and we wanted to be more graphic and yeah. more, uh, you know, uh, if, if there's 2D elements, and but figuring out actually how to make that work and what, you know, it's like it's like baking a cake. You can say you want a chocolate cake, but somebody's got to figure out, well, how much chocolate and how much flour and how many eggs and how, you know. So uh, Justin was kind of the the master baker and uh, right. working with uh, working with the team at Sony in ImageWorks who had to figure out how to do all that stuff technically. Mm. That was a process that took us our whole first, uh, our whole first year to figure out, well, what is it? What does just a person look like? Right. You know, what does somebody standing mm. out in the daylight look like? What does light look like? You know, yeah. so all these very basic questions about what does it mean to translate the language of a comic book to the screen? We had to answer, think about and answer all of those before we could really uh, make the rest of the movie. How much free reign were you sort of given by Sony and Marvel with the characters? Because obviously there's lots of different universes and styles that play there, but was there anything that was kind of off limits or did they sort of give you free reign to sort of play in that world and see what you could come up with? You know, I think uh, we were given pretty free reign, I have mm. to say. Uh, uh, there wasn't too much feedback or uh, communication with Marvel, as I remember it. I think probably just on basic questions like, oh, can we show Iron Man? Can we use Iron Man or the Hulk? Yeah. No, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, there was stuff like that. No, you can't do that. Uh, you know, uh, they were, you know, you'd kind of have to get there okay if you were talking about, uh, well, actually, those, I think those were really the only kinds of issues that they yeah. ever weighed in on, you know. And they were a little nervous about, uh, I, I remember at one point about us killing uh, uh, the first spot, you know, uh, Spider-Man, yeah. the Chris Pine Spider-Man. But we were like, well, it was in your comic. He died in the comic. That's part of the Miles Morales story. And they kind of said, oh, yeah, that's right. We, <laughs> we kind of forgot. So that was okay. So they really, I think they were like, the the main the main uh, concern I think from both Sony and Marvel was mm. that the live action Spider Man and the animated Spider Man didn't get mixed up in people's minds. They right. wanted to make sure that those two were were uh, there. There was they didn't want to confuse the audience as to mm. well, wait a minute this happened in that movie does that mean it happens in this does that blah blah and so we ended up sort of playing around with that idea yeah. anyway and kind of saying well. In our animated world, all that stuff in the animated movies happened. And we kind of refer to versions of some of those events, uh, just playing with the idea, the larger idea of Spider-Man, which is a lot of what our movie, our movie ended up being about. Uh, but it was, uh, for the most part, we kind of had a free hand and, and just like went for it. Mm. It's interesting too that you say that because the the amazing Spider-Man movies that came out, two of them, were released mm -hmm. in quite close proximity to Spider-Man Homecoming. Yes. So you, as an audience member, unless you study the production and stuff like that, you might go, okay, this is the third part of that trilogy, but now there's a different Spider-Man and everyone else right. has changed. Right, 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 exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, valid reasons for not wanting to confuse people, but I, yeah. gen in general, with those movies, people seem to accept, you know, what they're looking at at the moment. Yeah. You know, you're just saying, this is how it is now, and people go, okay. I know I saw another one last week, but okay, I'll take your word exactly. for it. If, it, if it's good, <laughs> I'll go for the ride. It's kind of like DC movies, there's no continuity at all now there's like about 50 jokers and all of them have won <laughs> right, exactly. no one cares they just make a good film entertainment exactly exactly so do you have any i mean of course you do but what what are your favorite moments from spider-man into the spider-verse probably the, the very favorite favorite moment was the moment we were done working on it, probably <laughs> um 
Oh, oh so many. I mean, there's two key emotional moments that I that I love. Mm. <laughs> Oddly enough, they both take place in Miles' dorm room. One, obviously, where he's talking to his dad through the door. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful sequence. Um, there's the other one where uh, all the other spiders, uh, that takes place before that, is where all the other spiders come and they basically tell him, look, you can't come with us. We don't think you're ready yet. The scene that he has with Peter where Peter spins him around in the chair and kind of tries to, you know, he's basically talking him out of uh, what he thinks is a very dangerous decision. And just the, the emotion that comes out of that and the, the way that, uh, you know, so much of that movie is about pe- different people from different backgrounds connecting through something that is in common with all of them mm. that felt really powerful. And I, I just thought that scene really, uh, really kind of nailed the emotion. And then by the time we get to the end of the movie and the, uh, the, when things really go crazy with the dimensions beginning to collide and that, because, uh, because, you know, I storyboarded a ton of that stuff and yeah. we really, we've worked on so many versions of it, you know, in, in storyboards and layout and editing and uh, just, you know, hoping that we could all get it to make sense. And when we started seeing the finished shots coming back from uh, Sony Imageworks and we saw how like, you know, beautiful they were with the color and the design, you know, and, and you know, you work on all this stuff step by step and you're like saying, oh yeah, those colors look great. We could try that. And oh yeah, this lighting is cool. That looks beautiful. You know, you're looking at that painting and you're giving notes, but uh, seeing it actually like the, the finished version with the music and the sound and the it's overwhelming. It was, was really well. And yeah. I loved too that because the price of it to me was exciting anyway, but you didn't hold back. You really went all in and invested in that. And, you know, you allowed the film to get as crazy as it got, but then have these, you know, really sort of emotional, beautiful scenes between the characters mm-hmm. too. And it's, it's such a rich film, just the textures of the artwork and, I remember reading at one point that Miles Morales, when he was first learning about his powers, was swinging through the trees. And Peter Parker, who had more experience doing that, the animators used 12 frames per second for Miles and 24 for Peter Parker to make the animation seem smoother and less jerky. Actually, that's a bit of an urban legend. Is it really? I can see why people would think that. Yeah. But those characters are still both animated on twos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the rest twelve frames and, per second. Yes, exactly. And and so that's stand, that's through the whole movie. That's the style we decided to go with, mm. just to get a different, a slightly snappier feel to go with, uh, to go with the idea of this being a more graphic and a more two D feeling film. Right. We also wanted the animation to have a little more pop and a little mm. less. There's sort of a, in CG films, there a lot of times there's this really flowy kind of uh almost liquidy smooth feel Mm. that we started to want to move away from because for us uh it for us that it 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 communicates so much communicates the computer in the animation process that we wanted to step away from it and do something that was going to feel a little more raw i love that so it's it's kind of like a really people thinking that Peter's animated on ones and Miles is on twos. It's really kind of a tribute to our animators mm. who just knew how to communicate that Peter is more experienced and more uh, confident than Miles, who's hesitant and a little clumsy. And yeah. he's des- actually, it's also about character design. He's designed to be a little awkward and he's got the long thin legs and the sharp elbows. And so it's, uh, I can totally understand why people think that, but, Mm. unless I miss that one meeting, <laughs> they're all on twos. Wow, that, so we've debunked that myth, so it's amazing yeah. and exclusive. <laughs> one, I'd love to share a memory with you too. Before the film came out, this is kind of stuck. I always think about this whenever I think of the film too. I went to see a midnight screening. It was the first screening of Venom when it was coming mm-hmm. out, and I was excited because there was going to be an extended clip of Spider-Man oh, right. and Spider-Verse after the credits. Yeah. So, 
the first thing that stuck with me was nobody moved from their seats. Everyone stayed there. This was oh, at great. midnight. Uh -huh. And the second thing is, so when it finished, so bearing in mind, this was a, a Spider-Man spin-off and all that kind of stuff and all the stuff they'd just seen in the actual film. Mm -hmm. Everyone that I had walking out of the movie theater was talking about Spider-Man into the Spider-Man. Wow. Wow, how wild. Yeah, and like that, they were like, this is the film I need to see, you know, and I didn't hear a single mention of Venom. It was all about <laughs> that, and that was amazing to me. Wow, incredible. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember the, the lead up to the movie, uh, our, when our first trailer came out, and everybody, uh, there was such a such a, an amazing response to that because they saw, oh my God, Miles has a hoodie and he has Nikes, and, you know, nobody could believe it. Yeah. And, uh, that uh, that felt like it, it just touched a chord, and people were ready to see a new take on the character. And now I must congratulate you because at the ninety first annual Academy Awards, mm -hmm. Spider Man won Best Animated Feature amazing i was so happy when they when i always stay up at five in the morning or something and watch in the uk what what did that feel like having worked on the film for so many years you know it was amazing it, it was it was like a dream i mean literally like a dream we couldn't really believe because we were so late finishing that movie mm. that really i think uh this like a day after uh a day after we turned over the finished movie, the first reviews started coming out because <laughs> wow. we were so close to our release date. And, uh, you know, when the journalists, they see earlier cuts of the movie yeah, yeah. and they get their, uh, they write their reviews essentially before the movie is released. Hmm. And uh, yeah, I think the day after we, uh, we turned it over the complete, the, the, at the finished movie, <laughs> We were starting to read reviews and people were raving oh. about it. It was this weird, like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. But it's like, it's not even out yet, you know? <laughs> and so that whole awards period was like a weird dream because we were exhausted from making, we were truly exhausted from, you know, working like nonstop three years making the movie. And uh, then being thrown into the award season is like a full-time job on its own. Uh, with the travel and the uh, publicity and interviews and all, all the rest. And uh, it was really like being in the middle of a tornado. So by the time we got to the Oscars, you know, we had won all these other awards uh, and the response to the film had been so great that uh, I think going into the Oscars, we knew our odds were really good. But when they call your name and say that you've won, yeah. It's still like what it actually <laughs> it actually happened. <laughs> this is real. What's going on? Yeah. So it was uh, it was completely amazing. It's phenomenal. I was so happy for you all to have won that. And you you spoke on stage as well. Did you pre-plan anything you were going to say, or did it just sort of come out from the heart when you were up there? Uh, a combination? I think we yeah. all you know we. You know, we were all like, okay, we're only going to get 45 seconds to get to be up there. So everybody's got to figure out what, you know, and we, there was a whole thing. Well, who's going to talk and how many people and we want to, uh, you know, and you, you get up there and you want to say something. So uh, yeah, we, we pre-planned what we were going to say, but you know, inevitably, you know, somebody goes a little longer than you think they're going to go or they, they, uh, we had a, and we had a big team of, of, of people. Yeah. So I think poor Bob got cut off a little at the end. Uh, but we had we had our little pre-planned thing that we were going to say together. Sure, it and was a, a great moment. You made history too. You're the first black director to win an Oscar for an animated feature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how did that sort of resonate with the community and filmmakers and all that kind of thing? It must be so inspiring for everybody on their way up as well. Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. for me, you know, being on the inside of all of it, and uh, you know. Uh, it's, I was, I, of course, I was, I, I was aware of the, you know, position I was in and the place, mm. but you know, when you're working on something as an artist, you're just working and trying to make it good. You're yes, really yes. not in general thinking of like any kind of legacy or, Oh, how important this moment is. And you just want to get it right. You know, you just want to, you know, put your best foot forward. Mm. So uh, for me, uh, it's, it's it's really it's really moving and to know that it inspires other people yeah. and 
you know, to go back about, to go back to what I was saying at the very beginning of our talk, you know, I never had any idea when I was a kid that I could do what I'm doing now. I just, it just, it never entered my mind. It never entered my consciousness. I thought movies, you know, whether they were animated or live action, just kind of dropped out of the sky. Yes, I, I felt know. the same thing. Yeah, right? I mean, I yeah. didn't, they, they were just like these magical things. And then when you, you know, when you start realizing, oh, wait a minute, people make them. And, you know, but you're not seeing anybody like you ever make them. Mm. You, you know, it takes a little longer for you to connect the idea that, oh, wait a minute, maybe I can do that too. So I, I just have to think anytime any kid, you know, a black kid or a kid of color or, you know, anybody who doesn't feel like they're, you know, represented in the industry, they can be gay, a woman, you know, anyone. That means so much to people. I think it means, I think people don't know how much it means until they actually see it. Absolutely. You know, it's one of, it's one of those things uh, you just don't really even understand in yourself what it actually means to you until you see it happening through someone else. And then you go, oh, it's real. And that's why I love doing these interviews to sort of share, because I, I love film. I've always loved film. And mm. I thought the exact same thing. I thought it was like the secret society of people, yeah. that the secret society of filmmakers make these films and they just magically appear in the mm -hmm. cinemas and on video at the time and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just, I'm endlessly fascinated about the process and yeah. films I love. I just love talking about them and to the, the creative people that, you know, because a lot of people watch films, they don't even think about the people behind the camera that right. work on these things that bring these stories to life that you love. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I love sort of celebrating on my show. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's, uh, there's so much people don't know. There's, there's so many things that, uh, that was one of the things that blew me away when I first started working in the industry, how many jobs there were that people could do if only they knew that they were there, yes. you know? Just, this, I'm just curious, uh, when the film won the Oscar, how mm -hmm. many Oscars were the team given? Do you get an Oscar? Do you borrow or not? Do you have it on alternate days? What happens yeah. with the Oscars? No, I actually got one. I was kind of amazed. And there's a, there is a, like a limit. I think they don't give out any more than four or five. I think right. there's like a, a limit, you know, depending on the size of your team. Because, you know, nowadays movies will have like 12 producers and it's, yeah, it's like, yeah. Okay. Everybody can't get one, but if you are a director, you get one if your movie wins an Oscar. So I, I really didn't, number one, uh, you know, you don't expect that a Spider-Man movie is going to win an Oscar. So none of us went into the movie at the beginning thinking, oh, we got a shot, you know. We didn't think that was going to happen. And then uh, even when we were up for it, I was like, oh, well, the studio, you know, I'm, I guess we'll get one Oscar and it'll be at the studio and it'll, I can yeah, be yeah. proud of that or whatever, you know. <laughs> but to actually, to win it and then actually get one is just like mm. ridiculous. Phenomenal. And so I must ask you then, where do you keep your Oscar? I mean, if I ever won an Oscar, I just carry it around all the time. I'd be like, <laughs> oh, this whole thing, oh, that's just my Oscar. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. Um, it's, you know, it's sitting on a, we got a, we have, there's a little shelf over where our TV is and boom, it's sitting right up there. So it's whenever I see one on TV, because a lot of times I forget that I have it. <laughs> but I'll see it on TV and then I'll look up and I'll, oh, wait a minute, there's another one right up there. <laughs> I, I was so thrilled that you, you won an Oscar for that film and it was highly deserved. It's a phenomenal movie and one of the best superhero films of all time, genuinely. Wow, thank you, thank you. It's we had, we I'll I'll say it again and again. I, we had an amazing, amazing team of people from the top to the bottom. Mm. And for me, I mean, for me, winning, you know, actually uh, getting an Oscar on that movie is like for me being on a football team or a soccer team, and you win, your team wins the World Cup. That's what it feels like for me. I, I was just a part of you know, this like, this like a machine of amazing people that made it possible. And so the, the film's done phenomenally well, of course it has, and there's talk of a sequel and a spinoff and stuff like that. Do you know anything about those? Will you be involved in those in any capacity? I know a little. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know some. I can't. Re- I can't really uh, talk about it too much. The the the. Uh, the I think the the sequel was definitely announced, so yeah. it's, you know, people know that it's it's in the works. But uh, yeah, it's it's very early days. You know, uh, uh, there's uh, really fantastic people involved. I'm really excited about uh, about the ideas that I've been privy to. I don't know that much, uh, <laughs> but I think it's. Uh, I think people are going to be really happy and uh uh yeah miles's story continues basically it's very exciting i can't wait to is it 2022 20, 2023 20, i think one of those i think it's 2022 there, there was a little shifting around because of uh the coronavirus yeah but i think it's still i'm pretty sure now i must ask you which other cinematic universe would you love to see the different char- characters of it combined will we ever see a peter ramsey verse one day <laughs> Ooh, i don't know there'll be a pretty small universe um <laughs> oh my gosh i don't know i hope i mean in some way shape or form who knows but i i yeah i don't know i'm just kind of taking it a day at a time a day at a time and and enjoying uh enjoying having some opportunities and possibilities uh because of uh you know how well spider-verse has done of course and i said what you were an executive producer on hair love yes yeah i was very proud of hair love that was a another another big big surprise and something that uh matthew cherry man he just uh he had an idea uh Mm and a vision for it that lined up with where a lot of people's feelings were. And uh, uh, he put his finger on the pulse of something that uh, was uh, uh, very close to a lot of people's hearts mm. that uh, just, it just resonated. It was the right time in the right place. And uh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, other great thing about hair love with there are uh, a couple of other super talented black animation veterans, uh, Bruce Smith, mm uh bruce smith everett downing and frank abney all of those guys are friends of mine and they were a huge part of uh bringing the animation to the screen in a way that that made hair love work so all of those guys just like deserve uh, a huge uh well they des- deserve an oscar and they got one <laughs> <laughs> exactly that was another film that i was thrilled to see when and i love the story too that started off as a kickstarter and then there was kind of there was a book was released yeah and I, I think the kickstarter worldly got more money than they were sort of expecting or oh, even yeah, looking broke for all kinds of records. yeah math yeah, yeah Ma- matthew cherry he's just he's a powerhouse and uh, he's directing a lot of tv now and you know mm. if anybody's going to have a verse uh, uh if there's a it'll there'll be a matthew cherry verse before there's a peter ramsey verse i'm sure <laughs> well, I, I can't <laughs> wait to see both of them and i hope they happen uh, thanks so do much. You ever, do you ever go back and watch any of the early stuff you worked on, you know, like Round Elm Street Three, or you know, any of the sort of early movies? You know, when when they pop up, I'll take a I'll take a look. But generally, when you work on something, you've seen it so much that it's kind of like, yeah, I think I've I, I've had enough for like the next yeah. ten years. So uh, yeah, sometimes I'll I'll uh, I'll look back on things, and usually I'm so like I don't know when I've been working on something and I see it for the first time, I'm always like, Oh, that should have been better. That should have been better. <laughs> ah, rah, rah, rah. I get kind of grumpy uh, because I've got, you know, stupid, unrealistic expectations of how good things should be. And then, uh, but then, you know, years will go by and I'll see it on TV. and I'll, Oh, that's better than I remember. <laughs> so that's just me. <laughs> Fantastic. And, can you let's completely change the subject now? Tell me a fun fact about you or a hobby or a party trick, something people may not know. <laughs> oh boy, that's interesting. Uh <laughs> fun fact. Uh I uh er, oh I can play the guitar. How about that? Wow. Fantastic. Not all that great, but I can play some. That counts. <laughs> do, you, do you read music or have you sort of learned, because some people just learn how to play things and I don't really understand how without learning sheet music. And- uh, you know, I, I took lessons for a while when I was, when I was a kid, when I was mm. like, I don't know, probably like age, like 10 to 13 or something like that. Yeah. I took lessons and I got pretty good. And, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you know, you get a little older and you start getting interested in girls and, you know, other, yeah. you know, 
other things. So my repertoire of, of things I can actually play is pretty limited, but uh, I, I, I can bust it out every once in a while. And, <laughs> it's always and, good. So. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to play an instrument and I've, you know, I've sort of tried to, I actually have mm -hmm. an electric guitar upstairs, but I haven't ever learned to use it. So it's just mm -hmm. there, but the mm -hmm. idea's there. For the future. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I four seconds. Oops, have you got any messages for the LGBT community around the world? I do. Uh, get out there, be yourself, share yourself with the world. Uh, you know, people, one, one big thing about, uh, about uh, Spider-Verse is it's so much about, you know, uh, the power of, uh, uh, the power of unity in diversity, mm. you know, that everyone, no matter where they're from, they all, everybody has common bonds. Everybody has, you know, the same, uh, spirit inside and, uh, you know, the world needs that the world really needs it. So it's, it's, it's a, you know, a lot of times you, you feel alone or you feel isolated. You feel like nobody understands you or you feel rejected and you just have to know that beyond all of that, you know, the world actually does need what you have to offer. So uh, I know it's, it's harder for, uh, I mean, it's hard for anybody who's been, you know, some kind of minority mm. and, you know, LG, LGBT people, of course, like, you know, that's a, a huge there's so far to go with uh um people really uh completely understanding and accepting uh but uh you know i i i hope i hope people feel like it's getting better because from my vantage point it certainly seems like it is but what i'd mostly want to say is you know uh bring what you are out into the world and uh the world the world needs the world needs it, man. The world needs people with good hearts who are willing to, uh, willing to put themselves out emotionally and, and uh, to connect with other people. That's very good advice. Now I saw uh, today actually on Twitter, you've posted the opportunity for black animation storyboard artists and TV show creators to sort of get in contact with you and show their portfolios and you'll offer them advice. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's just, you know, there's, there's obviously because of what's going on with the George Floyd situation and the whole, really something that's been building up for like, you know, well, in our country forever and ever, all over the world, I think, but yeah. uh, the I, it feels like there's a, a groundswell and a moment at which people are realizing change actually has to happen. And that means, you know, action instead of talking. It means, you know, listening to people who uh, haven't been listened to and that includes art you know in the world of art there's so many incredibly talented uh black artists who have felt marginalized or you know have actually been kept out of the system not because of themselves so you know the idea that uh there's places where people can be seen you know people uh have the opportunity and the the, the license to kind of step up and show who they are and what they can do. And, uh, you know, really on Twitter, all I'm really doing is saying, Hey, everybody show what you got. You know, mm -hmm. there's people out there who need to hire people. There's so many, uh, you know, I get calls from producers and, 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 Oh, can you recommend anyone? Do you know anyone? We're looking for good story artists. Who would you recommend? And it's like, I, they're all around. There's so many people who are undiscovered talents who are just, waiting for the opportunity so you know now that i've got a little uh a little bit of a of a larger voice in the public square i like to at least you know the least i can do is to provide an opportunity for the people that follow me to see the work of other people who otherwise wouldn't get the recognition or the chance so it's you know it's a very easy thing for me to like post a hashtag or you know but if if it means that people's work is going to be seen by a wider array of people uh then fantastic you know that's that's one of the benefits of of suddenly getting this kind of weird uh uh increased attention that i that i get now because of uh spider verse 
it's such an important thing to to give people that first opportunity so you know some people might you know try and get to the top and then you know push the ladder away but it's, it means so much to so many people when you're sort of willing to you know give people a hand up and just give them advice and just the inspiration to send their first email or make oh, yeah. the first piece of artwork exactly and i'm seeing all this artwork on you know being posted on twitter and instagram and you know I wasn't that good when, <laughs> when I was these people's age. It's just phenomenal what, what you see, you know, and there's a, there's such a, uh, there's so much out there that uh, the world, like I said, Hey, the world, the world needs it. The world needs to, to hear, you know, new voices saying this stuff because mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're ways of telling stories and ways of looking at the world that we really haven't seen before, you know, and it's only, it's only uh, it's going to be better for art because it's fresh and new. It's yeah. better for people because they're getting exposed to to new perspectives. Uh, it's it's just uh, it's it's a win win situation for everyone. I hope too that it's I mean the devastating heartbreaking situation that's unfolding at the moment. I hope that mm. they finally is the catalyst for change and so that people aren't just sharing and retweeting stuff but actually educating themselves and in turn helping to educate others. Um, exactly. So that this, this is literally could be the end, I hope, or the beginning of that. So Hopefully, or the, at least society. the beginning. Yeah, at least the beginning of the beginning, you know, I mm. mean, it, it, it really is. It, it really, a lot of it is just realizing what a simple, what a simple request it is to just treat everybody as human, you know, as yeah. you would like to be treated. That's really what it all comes down to. It's, I guess it's, you know, for years, it's been harder to actually do than it is to say, but that, you know, that's true of a lot of things in life, but yeah. now it's like, we can see the, we can see the cost of not living up to that. And it's just too much. And, you know, people aren't, people aren't willing to take it anymore. That's it. You know? I'm, I'm sending all my love and support as well. And we'll continue to make the rest of my life I'll be an ally and fight and speak up and to make the world a little bit better. Thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you i mean you're, you're amazing and the films you've worked on and all that kind of stuff is phenomenal and you're putting so much just amazing art out into the world yeah. ah well thanks i'm i i i, I do my part but it, it's it's uh like, like i say i'm it's uh i'm usually part of a team of wildly talented people so you know that's that's to me that's really what it's all about the the common goal and and working toward that Absolutely. That's a, the lovely thing about animation, isn't it? Because it really is a collaboration. Absolutely. Uh, it's one of the most collaborative art forms, I think. And can you tell me what you're working on next? Have you got anything else in the pipeline? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I'm a executive producer on a couple of animated projects. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't talk about them too much yet, unfortunately, but <laughs> they're moving uh they are uh, even with the whole situation with the the coronavirus. They're yeah. kind of moving forward, and uh, they're they're they they're really exciting though, and they're yeah. really hopefully going to be uh, trying. Uh, we're really trying to like you know preserve the spirit of something like Spider Verse and that you know let's get people some let's give people something they really haven't seen before. Mm-hmm. Let's really try and create something new. So uh, we're, we're really trying to, to carry that baton. And then uh, uh, there are, there, there are a, couple, a couple of other animated things I'm involved with that are also super early stages, can't really talk about them. And then there are a couple of live action uh, feature films that I'm attached to direct. And that is a case where coronavirus is kind of like, you know, messing up the plan. <laughs> so yeah, so we'll, you know, we'll see when that stuff comes to fruition if it ever does but i'm very hopeful that uh that those will be exciting and fun too i'm sure they will be everything else you've ever worked on has been i'm, I'm very excited to find out Thank more you. about what you're working on next i will ask you this though of all of the mysterious secret projects you're working on might we be familiar with some of the things like some of the characters or some of the ips or the universes or are they all sort of completely new there's uh, there's one you might be well yeah there's definitely one you would be familiar with <laughs> and uh, another one another one that has been announced it's a uh, it's a movie about Robert Johnson right. who was uh, the the very famous uh, blues singer the people a lot of people have regarded him as the greatest blues singer 
mm. who, uh, the, you know, the legend of him selling his soul at the crossroads to become the greatest blues singer. So uh, that's one, uh, one of the live action features that, uh, that we're developing that I'm attached to. So that one's been announced so I can, you know, I feel <laughs> like I'm free to talk about that, but hopefully uh, that's going to be really fun and a real, uh, a real, uh, hopefully, a, a pretty wild look at the at the legend of Robert Johnson. Well, I'm I'm very excited to learn more and see more about the film, mm -hmm. and of course, watch it when it comes out. Hopefully, Great. not too far away. <laughs> and, <laughs> hopefully um, not. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Yeah, I do. Hi, guys. Um, Lovely to be with Sarah. Lovely. Um, I hope you're enjoying the uh, the interview. And uh, just want to say, uh, you know, what can I say? We're all living through a crazy time in the world. I hope you're all well. I hope, really hope everybody's staying healthy. Uh, it's super important. Like I said, you know, we need you all. We need your good energy. And um, I hope everybody is, uh, you know, trying to create something that uh, is going to inspire and uh uh, inspire and uh, give other people a little hope that you know things can get better. Well, Peter Ramsey, thank you so much for coming on my show. It's been an absolute honor speaking to you about all the amazing films you've worked on. Now oh, the honor is all mine. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me. It was and really fun. <laughs> thank you, and thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up, and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. <laughs> Take care.